ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2013 World Conference North America. How's everybody doing in here today? All right, excellent, excellent. We're going to learn some interesting things about the Nagios Light Bar today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Stern. Give him a big round of applause. So as I was coming here, uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine at work, and he said, Dave, in these days when the government is shutting down, how is it you get to go on conference travel? I said, well, I'm presenting. And I said, oh, what are you presenting? And I said, oh, the Nagios Light Bar. So he thought about that for a few seconds, and he said, so let me get this straight. You get to travel on somebody else's dime, and all you've got to do is talk for an hour on turning on a light. Do I have that right? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, that's probably technically true. And he said, well, where do I sign up? So maybe next year there might be a few more people from Applied Physics Lab here. As you would expect, the light bar visually replicates Nagio states. Each light bar represents a different domain that we're responsible for. When I say domain, I mean a bunch of interconnected networks. Obviously, the domains themselves are not connected to each other, thus the need for multiple light bars. There is an earlier project called Nampel. I believe that stands for a combination of Nagios and Ampel. Ampel is apparently the German word for traffic light. Obviously, this project was out of Germany. Uh, at the time that I looked at it, the instructions were written in Germany. In German, and despite my surname, uh, my German is a little bit rusty. It's a very brilliant project, actually, but unfortunately, it was a little bit um, hardware heavy. That is, it required um, soldering electronic components onto a dedicated computer. Our solution is a little bit more flexible using off the shelf equipment. As to why anybody would need one of these, Applied Physics Lab does a fair amount of work for the Department of Defense which implies classified networks. And obviously, these networks must be air-gapped from the rest of the world. In fact, they're air-gapped even from the Applied Physics Lab internal network. That means that sitting in my office, I have no idea what's going on in one of these closed areas. Having said that, obviously, it doesn't hurt that it's eye candy. Uh, certainly, managers appreciate seeing this kind of stuff. They bring around the sponsors, that is, the people that pay us money. And they certainly like hardware and flashing lights. So everybody wins on this. Uh, flashing back to the previous slide, you may have noticed that the light bars appear to be in a public area. And indeed, they are. They are just outside of various people's offices adjacent to uh, closed areas. So we had some really fascinating conversations with our security people before they would allow us to drill a hole through the cement wall into a closed area, thread through a cable, backfill it with sound deadening cement, and well, ultimately, all we're doing is sending a binary signal back through this cable uh, representing the general static status of the network. So nothing classified there. Ultimately, somehow, they bought it. So here's the equipment. What you're looking at is a light bar, a base unit, and a series of power sources. Turns out that the diameter of a can of Red Bull is exactly two inches. So if you're setting up one of these you know, crime scene pictures and don't have a ruler with you, that'll give you a good sense of scale. So the long and the short of this is uh, the base unit itself is rather small. It's about the size of a pack of cigarettes, not much bigger. You do need the base unit to operate the light bar. Uh, the equipment comes from a company called Abtec Corporation. They make industrial, gra industrial grade sensors for factories and other applications. We've bought into their equipment in a big way uh, over the last few years. This particular base unit has a built-in thermometer and it has ports for additional thermistors. So the little thermometer is about that big, connected to a few dozen feet of cabling. Um, we strung those up all over our server rooms. I installed Nagios Graph, and we got a really good understanding of what our cooling is like in our server rooms, both behind the cold and the hot rows. That is the uh, rows on the back of the racks where they're blowing out here, uh, hot air. Uh, in that particular case, the deviation was no more than roughly two degrees at any point in time. That's actually going to change now. We're moving into the direction of clusters. And when users submit thousands of jobs to cluster, those things really heat up a little bit. The fans start spinning, and the back of it sounds pretty much like the deck of an aircraft carrier. So I imagine using Nagios Graph again, I could probably correlate the temperature coming off the back with the uh, CPU utilization. All Aptech equipment is meant to be controlled by SNMP. So here's another view of the base unit unobstructed by any cabling. From the bottom up, we see a port for power 
The device comes with a small transformer that steps down the voltage to about 6 volts. Just above that is a full-blown NIC. The network interface has an LED uh, indicating signal on the line as well as whether you're receiving and transmitting. And just above that is a, another LED to indicate whether the base unit itself is receiving power. And finally, at the top, you see three ports for uh, sensors. The top port has some gray plugs in it indicating there's a built-in sensor. On the back side of the base unit is where the light bar connects to it. Coming off the light bar, there's a ribbon cable in two sections. The longer one is for the light segments, and the shorter one is for sound. Indeed, the light bar does make sound. Uh, additionally, there's actually a small volume control on the bottom of the uh, light tower, not visible in this picture. Unfortunately, you can't actually turn off the sound. It's either on or off. You can use the volume control to deaden it a little bit. So the equipment comes with some software, a device discovery program. They have one for Windows and one for Linux. You can specify a particular IP address to search for or search for a range of IP addresses over a non-routable Class C address. It will identify the AppSec device based on the MAC address. In this particular case, we see one with a 00204A prefix. As you probably know, uh, corporations buy uh, ranges of MAC addresses. And so obviously that prefix is for AppSec equipment. If this were a uh, operational network, there could be multiple AppSec devices on it. You would simply highlight the one that you're interested in and click on the web button at the top to start configuring it. It's assumed that you're going to be on the same network as the device itself. Obviously, the first time that's not likely to be the case. The device comes up with some sort of a Class C non routable address, probably a 169 address. So the first time, you need to connect to it with a crossover cable. Having said that, there's nothing wrong with making that your permanent configuration. If you think about it, uh, most server class computers have at least one or two or three or four network interfaces. So why don't you just dedicate one to the light bar? And you could go a step further. When this thing senses the particular light bar, you can see what the default IP address is and set that particular NIC to be on the same sub subnet as the default address for the light bar, and you won't have to do much more configuration. So in any case, you highlight the particular AppSec device you want to configure, click on the web button, and you're magically transported to a web page that's generated by the base unit. This is the default web page, also known as the status page. And we see a representation of the light bar, implying the light bar is plugged into it at this point in time. And in fact, looks like the green light is turned on right now. Just below the light bar, there are two icons for speakers, and they have red lines through them, indicating that the speakers are currently set off. Uh, they're referred to as audio one and audio two. The difference between the two of them simply being a faster or a slower beeping. To the right of the light bar, we see the built-in thermometer. And to the right of that, we see two grayed out areas where if you had additional thermometers plugged into those other ports, they would be live. Turns out that if you mouse click over the light bar, you can turn on the segments from this point. So it's kind of cool. Likewise, you can do the same thing for the sound. So from the status page, you would click on the settings button. And this opens up a whole bunch of things that you can modify. You really don't need to modify all of them, just one or two of them. In particular, obviously, the network settings so that you can actually talk to this device. So you can specify either a DHCP or a static IP address. In the case of a static IP address, obviously, you specify both the address as well as the subnet and the default gateway. Domain name service is optional. You're also going to need to identify the type of light tower that you're using. In this case, we're using the red, yellow, green with audio. Apparently, Aptex sells another one, uh, red, green without audio. Clearly, if you set the wrong light tower type, your mileage may vary wildly. For security purposes, you can specify a username and a password to associate with the light bar so that somebody else can't turn it on and off and go crazy or change the settings on you. As I mentioned, there are a number of optional settings. We're not going to look at them. Uh, here's an, exa an example of one of them. The built-in thermometer can read different scales, either Fahrenheit or Celsius. And likewise, you can specify the time zone as well as where to get network time service from. So once you're done with all the settings, 
is we want to click on the Save Settings button on the side there, and that's going to force the device to go through a reboot. During the reboot process, obviously, it's going to come back up on the network that you configured, at which point it would be a good idea to disconnect the crossover cable and put it up on the live network. Additionally, during the uh, reboot, the light bar goes through a power on cell test. When that happens, all light segments go on, as does the sound, for about 20 seconds, and then ideally, it goes off. The network must be active before you power on the base unit. Unfortunately, we've had a fair amount of experience with this. Uh, Fly Physics Lab is going through a fair amount of construction right now, so we've had a number of power outages, both planned and unplanned. In most cases, the light bar survives these without any problems. In some cases, it does not. It's not clear to me whether it just was coincidental that the ones that survived were, on, were in rooms that have uninterrupted power sources. In any case, obviously that means it would be a really good idea to specify a test within Nagios to make sure that the light bar is connected. We've also seen problems in the, during operational periods when a remote network uh, switch goes down. And obviously if the switch is on the network that the light bar is on, clearly there's going to be a problem. Uh, the good news about that is when the light bar loses network connectivity, it retains its last state. That means then that if the light was green, it'll remain green no matter what problems occur. It's assumed that at some point in time, you're going to go into the um, closed area, look at the web page, see that there's a problem, and go over to the base unit and power cycle it. That's all that's required. If you think about it, this is what happens during a power outage. Uh, chances are power comes up all at once when you bring back power. That means that the network device, router, or switch, or whatever you're using, probably won't reboot before the base unit comes up. And so the base unit will obviously lose connectivity. So again, you just need to power cycle it. At one point, I thought it would be smart to simply DHCP the address, but that's not going to change how it survives from a power outage. That's just a timing issue. If the network is not up, tough luck. So if you see a problem, obviously, you go to the web page, see um, uh, Notice that there is a test, a ping test of the light bar. It's unavailable. Go to the base unit and just power cycle it. So I mentioned that I was rather enamored by the fact that you could click on the web page and just turn the lights on and off without using SNMP, even though the light bar is meant to be controlled by SNMP. But then even as a child, I could never color within the lines. So I have this other project involved that would require wget, and wanted to figure out what the URLs were. I hovered my mouse over the web page, and that didn't really give me any useful information. I was expecting to see a URL on the bottom. Not the case. I looked at the source for the web page. Not much use. I suppose I could have done a TCP dump while I was clicking on it, but I tried a very unconventional approach for me. I contacted AppTech and technical support. And I asked them, what is the URL to control the light bar? And they said, Read the manual. So I got in touch with them again, and I said, I read the manual. I know there's a URL associated with the light segments. Can you tell me what it is? And they said, use SNMP. So I was sensing a bit of a trend here. So I changed my tactic a little bit, and I said, you know, you guys have this great product. It's robust. We've been using it for years. We love it. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's this product called Nagios, and it is the gold standard for monitoring hosts and networks. Now, I'm on this project where I really need the raw URL and I know it exists. And if I'm successful, I think a lot of people will be interested in your light bar. And they said, oh, why didn't you say so? Here's what you need. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. It was very close to that, unfortunately. <laughs> so in any case, obviously, this is pretty straightforward. In fact, these URLs look very much like what you would see in a Nagios web page. If we break these apart by the fields delimited by backslashes, in the first example, the second to last field delimited by backslash, lowercase t equals capital A2, that is the item you want to affect. In this case, A2 is the second audio device. And not too surprisingly, the last field, again delimited by backslash, backslash, lowercase a equals 1 means turn it on. And not too surprisingly, a equals 0 turns it off. Once you know that, of course, the rest is pretty straightforward. So if you substitute capital GR for A2, you'd be affecting the green light. Again, a, 1 equals on, 0 equals off. And capital OR for the orange light rather than the yellow will affect the, the orange light. And likewise, RE will affect the red light. So now we know how to turn the light bar on and off. Woo! 
So now we just need to get the Nagio status, and that should be pretty easy. If you look at a Nagio service page, ideally you see a whole bunch of green there. Sometimes, yeah, you see some red and orange and so on. If you were to wget those pages, it turns out that there actually would be an additional string in the web page that has problems, specifically service total problems. And that's not a typo. Those are basically headings within the page itself. So from our experience from making Nagios plugins, this should be pretty easy. We w get the page, we grep for that string, and we check the status code. Nice and easy. Okay, so now we know how to get the Nagios status. There's just one more piece of information. Most Nagios installs I've seen have some kind of authentication information associated with the website. And we're a closed club here. We don't want just anybody to look at the web page. So the way you would embed that information onto it would be something like this. HTTP colon slash slash the account name associated with the web page. In this case, usually it's Nagios admin, followed by colon, followed by the password associated with the Nagios admin account. In this case, the example nag dash password. I should have used something more imaginative. Followed by an at sign, followed by Nagios dash server, the name of the, the Nagios server itself. And the rest of the URL is exactly the same. And it turns out that you can use the same format for any kind of authentication, such as for the light bar. Just a piece of trivia, it turns out that Internet Explorer, if you were to type this into a web browser, it would not work. They consider this to be a security problem. But we're not going to be using browsers here. We're just going to be using um, the raw command line. So not a problem for us. So we're just about ready to roll some code, right? Not quite. Mission creep. So that's a military term that means, well, we came here to drain the swamps, but somehow we're busy wrestling alligators. It means that the mission kind of drifted from what you initially planned. In this case, it's a good thing. If we're going to go to all this trouble, why don't we add a few more bells and whistles? So the first thing we're going to do is, since the light bar can do sound, how about we have it beep to get your attention the first time there's an alert? And I very explicitly say the first time for a reason. Think about what a normal network looks like, if there is such a beast. Ideally, most of the time, it's going to be green. Then there's the other extreme where instead of getting just one alert, you get a whole bunch of them. I can think of two cases where that would be the occurrence. In one case, once again, imagine if you're monitoring a remote network with hosts behind it. That switch goes down. You can't reach those hosts. Obviously, Nagios is going to get a little chatty, and it'll make a lot of noise with all these alerts. The other extreme is with a power outage. Things go down. Things go up, ideally in a particular order. And Nagios is going to be beeping like crazy. Now, if you recall that first slide, those uh, light bars are in a public area. They're basically just outside of all those people's offices. And trust me, I know these guys. They're not going to put up with that kind of noise. They're probably going to walk outside, pick up a rock, come back inside, and you know, no good can happen after that. So again, we're going to make noise just the first time the alert occurs. OK, that's the first enhancement. The second one is also somewhat site-specific. Again, think military. They tend to see things in black and white. We only use the red and the green. We don't use the yellow, believe it or not. We do monitor things like a root disk or something. But if the root disk is beginning to fill up, that's already a problem. It's got to be dealt with now. So if we're not using the yellow light, how about we co-opt it for another purpose entirely and have it indicate unacknowledged or unhandled alerts? And we can get that pretty easily by going to the Nagios tactical web page. So here's what it's going to buy us. It'll allow us to look at multiple alerts and keep track of them. Here's the scenario. An alert occurs. The light bar starts beeping. The red and the yellow light come on. We get what's called the gopher effect. That's where heads start popping out of offices, offices to see which network the problem is on. They run to it. They either fix it or they don't. If they fix it, obviously the light goes green. If they don't, it means the problem is going to be there for a while. Maybe you have to F6 a disk or something like that. So they acknowledge it. They click on the little guy with the shovel. Does that guy have a name? It's got to be like a Nagios mascot or something. In, in any case, so as soon as they click on the acknowledge button, the yellow light goes out. Now imagine if later on another alert occurs. The yellow light comes on. So I know there was a problem we were dealing with. There's at least one more problem because of the yellow light. I check it out. Maybe I acknowledge it. And then later on, another alert occurs, and so on and so on. So now we can keep track of multiple alerts. So now we're actually ready to put it all together. And this is embarrassingly simple. First of all, in case it's not clear, this is not a plugin. I suppose it could be, but it isn't. Um, 
There's actually a few additional lines here that aren't really necessary. Uh, there are some echo statements just to show you what's going on. And it's missing the shebang at the top of this born script, but everything else is intact. So the first thing we do is we make a temporary directory. And the reason we do that is because we're going to be w getting files, so they'll have unusual characters in their name. It's just as easy to delete the entire directory rather than deleting individual files when we want to clean up after ourselves. And in fact, if you think about it, since this is a cron job that recurs, we could actually have a test at the top there to check to see if that directory exists. And if it does, exit because there's a problem. Next, we drop down to that directory and we do an H uh, wget. And I have a commented out wget with the authentication string, again, just to show you how it's done. And now we're looking for problems. If we see a problem, which we do in this section over here, we check to see if this is the first alert or not. And what we're looking for here is a flag file. And if the flag file doesn't exist, then start beeping for a few seconds, stop beeping, and then touch the flag file. And then we very explicitly set all of the lights on and off. You would think I just have to set the deltas, if you will, but this way, this script stands on its own. If something went wrong the last time, it'll fix everything. So obviously, where there's an error condition, we set the red light on and everything else off. And where things are good, we set the green light on, everything else off. Finally, we drop down here and we do a W get to the tactical web page, and then we search for unacknowledged problems. The string that we're looking for is unhandled. And if it exists, then just turn on the orange light. And then finally, clean up after yourselves. And it looks like I have a whole lot more time, so clearly this isn't just about the light bar. But wait, there's more. Okay, I mentioned that I wanted to use wget, even though I should have used SNMP to control the light bar. It's because I had another project in mind associated with Nagios. Let me describe to you our um, environments, what we do, and our business model. Obviously, we make and, ma and manage labs. Each of the labs are set up for a slightly different purpose. They happen to be interconnected. Now, imagine, if you will, if you had to set up a authenticated server like an L LDAP in every one of these labs. That would be prohibitively expensive from the business perspective. Additionally, imagine if you had to change your password. You have to go to each one of these labs and change your password. It makes a lot more sense to share these resources. So when I got to this group, they actually only had one Nagios install. And they called it the core Nagios, not to be confused with the core Nagios that Ethan just talks about. Uh, this is simply the core services. They include things like file servers, license servers, LDAP, Active Directory, and so on and so on. And that's all that they were monitoring. They take the more senior people and they throw them into labs and say, make this lab yours. So I guess you can probably guess what I did. First thing I did was install Nagios. I installed NS Client, I installed Nagios Graph, and all the plugins that I thought would give me useful information in my environment. I had plugins for printers and network devices. And I felt rather proud of myself and I offered up this service to the other lab managers. And I was met with a surprisingly lukewarm response. The way they worded it was something like this. Look, Dave, I've got hundreds of workstations in my lab. If one of them goes down, I don't care. We got others. If some Windows guy logs into a Windows server and in the process of logging out, they inadvertently shut it down, again, I don't care. If someone wants that particular workstation, they can just turn it back on. Well, this issue was forced by a group of people called DSS. It stands for Defense Security Services. They define the security protocols that we must follow, and I do mean must. They are not shy about just pulling the plug in any machine that's not compliant. Oh, and these guys are authorized to carry guns. IT guys with guns. So anyhow, most of the edicts that they set down are pretty straightforward. You must audit all of your machines, regardless of the operating system. OK, that's reasonable. On the Windows side, there's the event logger. And you can even tag individual files and folders to audit those as well. On the Linux side, there's the audit logger as well, audit server, rather. And it does pretty much the same thing. They're both very wordy, but it certainly will capture everything we need. So this is how are we going to deal with this problem where machines may or may not be up or down? Clearly. This is a Nagio solution waiting to happen. One solution would simply be to take all of our machines and throw them into one huge Nagio. And it's not really that huge. We're talking about, I don't know, a few thousand machines. Any server class computer can probably handle that. The issue here is what amounts to, for lack of a better term, quality of service. Some things are simply 
far more important than others. I mentioned I had a printer plug-in in my Nagios install in my lab. Imagine if my printer ran out of paper. And imagine if it rang the bell, so to speak. That is, the light bar went red. That's silly. And imagine further if a dozen IT guys responded to it because of that. that that's ridiculous. If you've been a sysadmin for any period of time, chances are your boss expects more from you now. Suddenly, just managing machines is no longer enough. They kind of expect you to understand the business model, the flow, and the process, and see where you can optimize things. If at one time you were building machines one by one through distribution, and it takes you four hours, wouldn't it be great if you could simply image it using DD or Ghost or something like that, and then just change the IP address and the host name, and bada boom, you got another machine. Or even better, imagine that you could build a new machine off the network via Pixie booting, DHCP, and have some rather imaginative host install script to tailor it. That's what they're looking for. They're certainly not looking for a dozen IT guys responding to a printer. So that's the problem. Here's the solution. The idea is, imagine if the core Nagios was aware of other Nagios installs in the individual labs. And imagine further if it could show you some indication that there's a problem, there's a, an alert of some sort, but it won't ring the bell, so to speak. And imagine if further you could actually zoom in to the lab in question and look at the problem from the core Nagios. And again, when I use the word core, I'm referring to the Nagios that really only monitors our core services. Thus was born the concept of hierarchical Nagios. And it's a really lousy name, doesn't roll off the tongue. I'd offer up a Nagios t-shirt for somebody to give me a better name, but I guess everybody's already got a t-shirt. Cool, I like that. <laughs> but it's taken. <laughs> so, what's wrong with this picture? Or what's right with this picture? Or at least what's different with this picture? Clearly this is a Nagios 3.x install service page. And the only difference we see is on the left frame, there seems to be an additional stanza there labeled labs. And under there, there are four items, two with green dots and two with red dots. I'm hoping it's kind of intuitive at this point. The lab names look really, really bizarre. Uh, but then we're government, WLA. We love acronyms. So it doesn't really matter what they stand for. But clearly, the ones that have red dots are probably problems. And as you would expect, since all these guys are clickable links, indeed, these are clickable links as well that would zoom into the particular Nagios uh, lab install and see what the problem is. So here's how it's done. First of all, this is a work in progress, so I don't have uh, much source code to show you. Um, but if you followed everything up until here, you should be able to follow this. It's pretty easy. Second of all, up until now, I haven't been modifying Nagios code. That's about to change. So you're going to want to back up everything, both before and particularly after you make these changes. Otherwise, next time you go to upgrade Nagios to, I don't know, like Nagios 4, you're going to wipe your changes. So that's step one. The next step, you're going to want to install a Nagio server in each of your labs or let's call them subsites to be more world-centric. And that's pretty straightforward. There are various tools out there that allow you to scan a network, see what is monitorable, and it will build a configuration for you. Or you can do it the hard way and you know, build it yourself. If you think about it, the Nagios config is probably going to look very similar from lab to lab. The top part will have like time period stanzas followed by defined command stanzas. The only thing you really have to build yourself are the host stanzas, define which services are going to be run for each of the hosts, and maybe group some of these services into individual host groups. So that's certainly doable. The third step is to modify the side.html or side.php, depending on the version of Nagios you have. And obviously, you're going to want to add another stanza, call it whatever's appropriate, labs or subsites. You're also going to want to make sure that information is relatively fresh, that it would be a shame to have a green dot when there's really supposed to be a red dot there. So if you add a little HTML tag, refresh rate of, I don't know, 300 seconds, five minutes, since my cron job is running in five minutes. These aren't necessarily synchronized, but close enough for government work. Okay, that's the third step. The next step, you want to tag all of the websites you're going to look at. What I mean by that is, we're going to be mixing and matching the sidebar, possibly from the core and possibly from other subsites, along with the main or service pages from other subsites. So what part of the page is for what? You're going to get kind of dizzy looking at those things. 
So you want to have some kind of an indication what this page belongs to. And that's pretty easy to do. It's just one line of HTML coding. In the case of straight HTML coding like main.html, you would just add a line with the name of the subsite, maybe change the font color and maybe the font size. You may want to do that with the history page as well. And you'll almost certainly want to do it with the service page. Now the service page is actually HTML code that's generated on the fly. And it's created by a program called status.cgi. If you go to the Nagios um, structure, under the CGI directory, you'll find status.c. Obviously, this is C coding, but it's very easy to modify because, once again, it's just creating, doing printf statements to create HTML uh, lines. So, once again, you simply add something that's, so that's appropriate for your particular subsite, and you're going to need to compile it. And the easiest way to compile it is use the make file that's already in that directory. Just say make and you'll result with a status.cgi binary. You want to copy that status.cgi into the install, and you'll need to do that for each of your subsites. Finally, we're back to the light bar. This is still a project on the light bar. We're going to have the light bar do the same thing that it did before, but it's going to do one more task. And by the way, since it's going to be modifying the side.html, now the cron job needs to exist on the core Nagios, if you will. So the light bar, the cron job, is going to still check out the Nagios core site and indicate when there's a problem and set the light appropriately. But it will also wget into the individual labs. And when it sees a problem, just swap a green dot for a red dot. And if you look in the Nagios structure, you'll find there already is a green and a red dot there. So most of your work is already done for you. You just need to use some scripting to swap the two dots. Uh, I happen to use SideScript. You can make it a little prettier using Perl. And finally, all that remains is try to figure out how you want to present this information to the Nagios users. Here's one way. I circled where I tagged the uh, subsite name. The subsite is in red. I'm not sure if it's quite visible over there. But ideally, you would think that, well, it's kind of weird. You know, Dorothy, we're no longer in Kansas. But I would hope it's a little bit intuitive. Um, chances are. This is obviously for the core Nagios. I know that because we got this additional stanza on the bottom. And this one is probably associated with this particular subsite. So if you were to click on anything here, you'd zoom into this subsite. And as soon as you click on anything over here above the lab stanza, you're back on the core. So I thought it was kind of intuitive. For about five seconds, I thought I'd you know, give it the name iNagios, but Apple would probably sue me. So this is one way to do it. The alternative because someone, some people thought the other one was kind of confusing, was this. How about if you have the core on the left-hand frame, and this is a subsite. I know that because, again, I circled where I tagged it. You can scroll down here, find where there's a problem, and then when you're done, click on one of these guys to zoom back. I found that a little confusing because, again, you're mixing and matching. The winning solution was kind of what they say, a little bit of both and not enough of neither. If you look at the um, coding on the side frame over here, each of these URLs has an additional piece of HTML tagging that says target equals double quote underscore main, close double quote. And what that means is whatever URL you're going to be running over here, execute it in this big main space, which is how we got a frame in a frame before. So it turns out that if you change that target to target equals double quote, underscore, blank, close double quote, you'll open up a whole new tab. And that tab will be completely dedicated to that subsite. So you can, there won't be a confusion on the left-hand side frame as to what it is. You can zoom into the particular um, subsite, see what the problem is. Once you're done, click on the X at the top of the tab. The tab obviously goes away, and you're back at the core. So we've, <coughs> we've done a couple of things here. There's hierarchical Nagios as well as the light tower. They're kind of opposites if you think about it. The light tower is really meant for seeing what's going on outside of the closed area, whereas hierarchical Nagios is really meant for seeing what's going on while you're inside the closed area. We actually did one more thing over the last few months. We opened up a, a new closed area uh, that has created a new restricted area that only sysadmins can go into. And we've trunked all of our networks into that room. And we've also added a bunch of large screen TVs on the side, um, each one dedicated to a Nagios install. So effectively, it's an operations center. 
and people that are not associated with a particular lab can do their work in there. They've been doing um, core work on, I don't know, like CF Engine or something like that. They're obviously very aware of what's going on in all of the other networks and they can control them from that same room. It's not clear which of these things really uh, helped us the most. I think the last thing probably helped us a great deal. It kind of changed the culture. If you're like me, uh, you become the Nagios guy. And if you, again, are like me and come in early, everything falls on your shoulder. Um, now more people are stepping up to it and responding to the uh, problems. So we've changed the culture somewhat. Um, I tried to get some statistics for this, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, we're going through a fair amount of um, construction. So we've had a number of power outages, as well as the fact that we're adding and removing hosts left and right. So the numbers that I have are kind of funny numbers. I'm looking at um, uh, hosts that have the highest longevity, as well as looking at time periods where there are no uh, power outages. So that already kind of salts the results. Regardless, the response time is decreased by roughly 30%, and the uptime is nearly uh, an increase of 10%. And obviously, we have a much better understanding of our networks. We sysadmins really love Nagios. It's just so incredibly extensible. I'm sure most of the people here have written their own site-specific plugins. But more than that, it just allows us to be heroes. I'm sure, again, most of the people here probably have responded to problems that users didn't even know existed, and the users were in awe of your skills. We sysadmins tend to be kind of a cocky bunch. After all, most days of our career, we're doing things we've never done before. I'd just like to leave you with this parting thought. We only got to be as good as we are because of those that came before us. Thank you. We have about uh, 15 minutes left, some questions. I'll come around with the microphone. Two questions, actually. Uh, what was the hardware source you mentioned originally? Um, Nampel, N-A-M-P-E-L. Uh, N is a network, A-M-P-E-L. Okay, and another question. Uh, what are you going to do when you have to upgrade Nagios? <laughs> You've got custom code in there. Uh, well, seriously, uh, if or when we do, I assume that this will still work with the newer version of Nagios. We will simply take our Psi.html stuff and copy it back in place or make the same updates to the new version of Psi.php. Any other uh, questions for David? Uh, just, a, just a quick question. We uh, have a considerably larger number of uh, devices that we're monitoring uh, through Nagios. Um, so we always have uh, items in alert. Is there a way to just send certain uh, alerts to the light bar instead of sending all alerts to the light bar? I'm sure there must be a way. Um, one way might be to group them um, in separate Nagios installs. The important ones are just the ones that are going to kick off the light bar, so to speak. That's certainly one easy way to do it. This is related. I was wondering if um, that wget script, if you can leverage the built-in um, Nagios display filters it's into that script. So like, I don't want to see anything that's acknowledged during downtime or anything that's flapping, if you can just put that into the wget URL. I imagine you probably can. Maybe simplify that wget script a little sure. bit. Sure, sure. And in fact, uh, I know there are a lot of built-in macros with Nagios, and you can probably tag them for individual sites, or machines rather, that you don't want to hit the light bar and pass in additional information as well, which you want to filter out and so on. Yeah, because I'm in the same situation. There's always 100 things that are, you know, warning or critical, and, you know, we just don't care about it because it's a downtime or somebody's actively working on it. Right. I think there is some kind of a new plugin. I didn't get a chance to look at it. It was like a Nagios business something or other that might allow you to group them differently so that some are more critical than others. I'm not sure about that, though. Just a comment on that. If you use the business process intelligence, you're That's able the to one. take the items that, uh, that are important to you, and you could, um, you could group them into uh, a particular group. Another option, uh, David's comment on what you had asked earlier for uh, adding um, different elements into the, the URLs should be no problem whatsoever. You can um, only look at particular host groups, service groups, or whatever. You can just pass them into the wget uh, um, request. You can filter down and only report on the ones that we want. Is anyone familiar with 
turf statics, uh, that CGI code, and look at the Nagio strip mask inside of it? I'm sorry? The Nagio strip, the Nagio strip mask, have you, are you familiar with that at all? Uh, I'm not so sure. So you I hover am. your mouse over uh, one of the top screens on the right that shows the status, and it says yellow, red, green, and blue all problems. Okay. If you look at the URL on the bottom, the numbers change in there for displaying certain things. That's oh. the Nagio spit mask. Okay. And I'm pretty sure it's well documented inside the actual code before you compile. And you can use that on your WGET line to solve your problem you're just asking about so only showing. Special. Yeah, see I create a special page so if something's acknowledged, it doesn't show up on my screen. If it's something has notifications turned off, I don't see it. I only see things that are not acknowledged or are not. Yeah, we're uh, having a running .h file soon. It does AI documents. Yeah, the bitmask. It's really easy. You just hover your mouse over the URL and look at it, and you can figure it out pretty easily. There's a bitmask for host and bitmask bit for services, yeah. and you can uh, leverage that yourself on your own custom pages. And is that in the status.c uh, coding? Or? I don't know exactly which file it's in. Uh, probably the status.c, but it's been part of the product since day one. So you should be able to easily find it. Now that you know it's bitmask and look right. at it, you'll, you'll figure it out. It, you know, any Google search will probably pull it up for you. Yeah, if you can grab the still the single source page that has the flat body okay. in the code. It'll, it'll just there's just one file that has all the you know variables in there. Great, thank you. Okay, anything else for David before he wraps it up here? Is there anything you're currently working on? Any upcoming projects uh, that you have um, you'd like to share? Not on a project per se. Uh, we've obviously done a fair amount of work with very specialized uh, plugins. I just want to mention one. Um, one of the plugins we have here, well, obviously, because we're concerned with audits, we basically have a little script that um, this is one of the rare cases where I actually use event handlers. Uh, not that I don't like them, I just don't necessarily believe in them because if there's a problem, fix the problem. Why does it keep on recurring? In this particular case, if audit ever gets shut down, uh, this will automatically notify you as well as try and restart it. Um, additionally, we've got a plugin for port violations. This is kind of cool. Um, again, think about our environment. In one case, we have a server room that's shared by multiple groups. And, and we're talking military again, so there's a certain difference of need to know. So one thing we can do for people that are sharing this computer room is uh, lock the racks. The problem is the network part is exposed. You know, basically, the patch panel is right on the top. So Cisco has some mechanism that allows you to specify sticky MAC addresses. Um, and if any new MAC address is seen on a port, the port just gets turned off. Uh, what I have here is some kind of a clever mechanism um, that searches for that. And the way it searches for it is ultimately it uh, just mm, switches syslog to the Nagio server. Uh, the plugin searches through it, basically using an epic to say, I've looked up until here. I'm going to look further, searches for report violations, and if so, it sends a flag. And it actually parses out the log file and says, this particular machine, this particular port is the problem. And further, there's actually another event handler, if you will, that allows users to click on the acknowledge button and it will wipe out that particular um, ill alert. All right, well, thank you, David. Uh, feel free to uh, give David a big round of applause here.